Um, the first thing we're going to say is what types of sealed system problems would you find if you're working on a refrigerator? A customer calls you and says, my refrigerator's not cooling. What type of sealed system problems that you could think of? Restrictions. Okay, restriction. Uh, leaks, refrigerant leaks. Leaks. That be considered a uh, sealed system problem? Yes. The condenser. Well, what would be wrong with the condenser, Gerald? It's not it pulling enough freon or don't not giving enough freon. Well, that would be like a leak or a restriction, not enough freon inside the condenser. Um, what else aside restriction and refrigerant leaks? Component failure like compressor. Compressor. Um, uh, what about an overcharge? Right? That a good... uh, unlikely from manufacturer. Uh, well, what if, what if a technician before you did a service repair? It's possible. So if someone before you worked on it, they could have overcharged the unit. Okay. So um, let's take a look at a couple of pictures. I sent you all the PDF document of the presentation. Um, Oh, good. I just said don't show the message again. I uh, um, I sent you all the PDF of this. So let's just go through the pictures, and then we'll come back to. Um, here's some different types of problems with a refrigerator. In the first one here, this is a defrost problem. Possible cause, open heater, terminator, controller timer failure. And if you look at it, the evaporator is, like, completely frosted. Are you guys able to see those pictures good? Yeah. Okay, because I know some people might be using a mobile device and it might be too small. Okay. This one is no airflow across the coils. I had a technician call me today and said that the evaporator fan was disconnected or not working. What is different between these two images where you can see the frost build up on this one? And I think I can zoom in on it a little bit so you can see it better. Let's let's take a look at those pictures. Compare these two pictures here. Um, what's the difference with the frost pattern on those two evaporators? You don't really have as much uh, frost buildup on the coils or on the, the fan, the grill, right? Um, and it looks like the tubes are freezing on the second photo. Okay. Um, you're right about where the ice is. In this case, the frost that build up is all around the evaporator. But why do you think it looks like this? Why do you think you only have frost up here and not that much frost down there? Because the defrost will be taking care of the bottom half. Exactly. Very good. Uh, so the heater, which you can barely see the heater running across the bottom here, is still functioning. So we're still defrosting. <laughs> and if we're defrosting, the heat is coming from the bottom and rising up. But it doesn't stay on long enough or apply enough heat to melt all the ice at the very top. And because the fan's not running, we're not pulling a proper airflow over the evaporator. So we're building up this ice everywhere on the evaporator, almost like this picture here. But it goes into defrost and melts the bottom half, and then it goes back into cooling. So that's why we would have this frost pattern or ice pattern at the very top. So let's take a look at this one here, sealed system problem. It says system restriction, refrigerant leak, or inefficient compressor. So why do you think it's just this portion here that is frosted? What is actually going on inside the evaporator that is causing that frost pattern? The gas expanding as it enters, but it doesn't have enough to make it all the way through the coils. Um, yes, you're somewhat right what you're saying. First of all, it's the liquid which is expanding to a vapor. And that, that line, um, someone just came in. Let me let him in.
Um, so uh, this line here is where the capillary tube meets the evaporator and enters the evaporator. And you can see the ice up to this point. What happens is if it's restricted, you're not letting enough refrigerant in there as fast as it could flow. And if it's restricted, the liquid is coming in, but only this much liquid at a time. And once it gets to this point where the ice stops forming on the evaporator, it has totally evaporated from a liquid to a vapor, and its heat absorption is totally lost at that point. So when you see a frost pattern on a refrigerator, and if I or anybody else asks you what's the frost pattern like, we want to see this whole evaporator have a small layer of frost on it all the way down. And when it hits the bottom right here, it goes to the back, and then it zigzags back and forth up the back side. So if we had a leak of Freon, then the pressures would not be right also, and we could have the same sort of frost pattern. So when we look at this type of leak or, or, or type of frost pattern, it could be a leak or it could be a restriction, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so I see it's this, and I think it's this or this. How do I, how do I determine that? So let's take a look here at a normal frost pattern. So if you look at this evaporator here, uh, this is the suction line in the back, and then this is the line that's feeding the refrigerant coming from the capillary tube right there, and the Freon's coming in, and that's a good frost pattern. Now, you're only going to see it like that after it's been running for a little while, like an hour or two or more, or if you had the cover off and you, you were not drawing the air across it properly, uh, you're going to see this much frost on here. But this is what we're looking for if a customer is saying, oh, my refrigerator's not cooling, and, and you think it's cooling, you want to look at the evaporator, and you want to look at the frost or the ice that's built up on it to determine whether you have one of these problems, defrost, airflow, sealed system problem, like a restriction, an efficient compressor, and, uh, or just a normal frost pattern. And if it's a normal frost pattern, then we have to look at other things. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, let's go look at some pictures first and, and just talk about a couple of the types of problems. And then we'll go back to um, what do we do when we see these problems. Okay, so here's sealed system problems. And this is different examples of leaks, inefficient compressor, and restriction. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you guys can see them better. Starting with the top. This is where the capillary tube is. It's insulated here. This line in the back here, what is this line going across? It's L-shaped. Defrost heater? No, that's the suction line right there. The defrost heater is a black wire running to the left and coming all the way down. So this L-shaped tubing is the copper where it meets the aluminum, and this is the suction line coming from the evaporator going back to the compressor. So what we're seeing here is a frost pattern on this line. And then if we look at it, um, the frost pattern is probably, re I think it's coming into the back because look at the frost down here only on a couple of loops. So if you look to the right, it says uh, refrigerant leak, system restriction, or inefficient compressor. The inefficient compressor is the valves inside the compressor. Uh, if the valves are bent or worn out, the compressor could still pump, but it will not pump the proper pressure, so it'll act like a restriction or a leak. So these are the three things we need to look for when we're looking at it. Now, if you look at this evaporator here, I can tell you this is a GE refrigerator. It would have a heater in the middle and a heater at the bottom. This one here, it only has a heater at the bottom. There's, there's no heater right here. Um, and there's only a frost pattern at the very, very bottom here. That's because the capillary tube runs through a line all the way to the bottom and the refrigerant evaporates as it goes back up to the top. Now, it looks like there's two separate evaporators, but this is just one long evaporator. And this is like a side-by-side -side refrigerator, the same as the, the picture in the top left. Um, now, if we look here, we have the same uh, refrigerator as this GE one. 
and we have a very similar frost pattern. The only difference, if you notice, if we can look at the two pictures together, let me zoom in just a little bit. If you look here, you have a heater at the very bottom, but we don't have a heater here. This particular picture shows a heater right here and the heater. These two heaters are in series, and we talked about that when we talked about the defrost components. And then again, it's just frosted at the bottom. So let's take a look at this one here. This line here is the suction line. The uh, capillary tube is coming in the back side of this evaporator, going to the bottom in the back. And you can see very carefully, let me zoom in just a little bit more. Can you see the tubes in the back have frost on them? They're inside each layer. There's another tube behind it, and it has frost on it. And then when we get across the front, up about this point, we start to lose our frost pattern. Now, this is frosted up, and you say, wait a minute, I see these loops in the front are frosted as well. That's because the line in the back is just making it so cold, the metal's conducting, and it's also absorbing heat and moisture, causing that frost to build up. So these are all similar examples of the same problem. When the suction line's in the front, the freon goes into the evaporator in the back. In this case here, the frost is in the front, so this is the capillary tube entering the front, and we get to about this point right here. All the refrigerant in this evaporator has evaporated. So these are all examples of frosted and frozen evaporators. Um, so look out for these, and we'll talk about how to service them in a minute. Now I have a couple other problems. Look at this old GE picture here. I'm going to bring it to the front. Now this old GE picture here, this is a top-mount GE refrigerator. The heater is a glass tube heater in here, and you have to be very careful when working on the heater on these units because they will break. Now, someone did some work on this. Can anybody tell me what work they think might have been done to this unit? I passed something. I don't know. Um, those yellow caps. Those yellow caps are called wire nuts. Wire nuts. Uh, so they, they hot wired something, maybe? Not hot wired. <laughs> what do you think this is? They thought it was a defrost problem. It's possible that it was replaced prior to, or they thought it was a defrosting problem, and they replaced the defrost thermostat. So okay. what it did is they cut it out, and they wired it up, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I like to take a little bit of electrical tape and tape up where the wires come in so that moisture does not get in the electrical connections and create an arc. But this, again, is only a partial evaporator frosted, and this is a sealed system problem. It's not a defrosting problem. So even if the heater was working, the heater runs the full length of this evaporator. And like I said, it is a glass tube, so when we're pulling out, we have to be careful not to break it. And this is only frosting up to here, and at this point, we have no more liquid refrigerant. It's all vapor, and we're not absorbing the heat. So with instances like this, we get partial cooling. We don't get full evaporator cooling on this unit. And um, this unit here, what do you think that is? What type of problem do you think that is? A restriction? It could be a restriction. A motor problem? It could be a restriction or a fan motor. Oh, okay, cool. Um, the only reason why is this where the capillary tube comes in. Look here. What is this evidence of right here, this ice that it's formed? What does it look like happened to the ice right here? Um, that it had defrosted and then it just started to freeze up again? That is Maybe. very correct. The, the heater's located on the bottom. It's a cow rod heater located here. And the heater runs up this side too and didn't melt it here. So either we do have a restriction or a low, a low charge and it's freezing up on that point. But it looks like more to me like we have an airflow problem 
And if we look closely, doesn't it look like the ice might be hitting the fan blade here? So that would stop the fan from rotating. So even if the fan motor stopped working and then it just miraculously tried to start, it's not going to because the ice now built up so high that it's going to stop that fan from rotating. So that is another sealed uh, system problem uh, or an airflow problem. So how do we approach this one if it's an airflow problem? What do we got to do to prove whether this thing is going to work or not? I mean, take a oh. heat gun to it and, you know, well, see, if the, see if the evaporator fan is getting voltage, and then I guess if it is, you have to home it out. Yeah, but before I would uh, check voltage, because those wires are behind that fan blade, so you're not going to have easy access to the wires on this particular unit. Plus, the motor part's buried in ice. You need to get the ice off. Now, don't ever use an ice pick or a sharp knife or something I have seen people stab the evaporator. I had one that someone had a blocked uh, airflow problem here, and they were poking from the refrigerator section up to get the ice out, and they went right up into the evaporator. And at that point, the evaporator is no good. And the customer has no cooling at all. But a heat gun could work, but with all this tape and electrical wires and these fan blades are usually plastic, a heat gun is not good for defrosting for two reasons. A heat gun is designed to apply excessive heat, 300, 500 degrees. All that styrofoam and all that plastic and all those wires are going to just melt. A hair dryer would actually work a little better. It does not get as hot, but it moves more volumes of air. And you would apply that heat at the bottom or, or put the heat right here in the middle and blow it up. But what I like to do is take a screwdriver and not the, the screwdriver metal end. I'd hold it from that end and I'd use the plastic end of the screwdriver like a hammer and I'd slightly tap on this ice, breaking the ice in pieces and remove it in chunks. So before you actually try to defrost an evaporator to get the ice off, just keep tapping it with a screwdriver. You don't have to hit it super hard. It's going to crack and break in pieces, and you can just grab that whole piece and throw it in the sink or, or in a bucket or something and reduce the time it takes you to defrost the unit. Again, be careful not to hit the evaporator and damage it, but it does reduce the time it takes to defrost. Some of my technicians use a small steamer. Let me uh, see if I can show you uh, what they look like. Um, Go to Amazon. I know I ordered one from one of my technicians, but um, these small portable steamers, it's important to have one. Let me see if I can look at my orders. Uh, you guys are going to see all the stuff I bought recently. Uh, search all orders, steamer. And okay, this one here. Um, I don't remember which one is the better one, but this steamer here has a little hose that can go on it, and it blows a high velocity of steam on the ice to help reduce the ice. Let's see if this video shows you how it works. Um, the thing is, is you have to fill it with water and give it time to heat up. So basically, that's what it is, and it's only $34. Now, the issue with those steamers is they don't hold a lot of water. So you could be defrosting a, uh, 
an evaporator and run out of water before it's totally defrosted. I like to use, uh, you all have used the air sled or, or the air mover that we have in the class to move the appliances around. And I like to take the blowing end of that vacuum and put a cone on it so it tapers down to a small opening and let it blow air onto the evaporator. A couple of reasons why. It has a lot more air volume, and the faster you can move the air across the ice, the faster you're going to melt it. And the air flows over the motor inside that vacuum, so what happens is it, it gets hot air, and so that helps it in, in melting the ice. And the difference between a steamer and that is if you have to fill the steamer up two or three times to defrost it, it's going to take you time to open it up, cool it down, put fresh water, wait for it to heat up, and use it again. But remember, you're adding steam to the melting ice. If you don't pay attention, when you're defrosting the evaporator, the issues with defrosting the evaporator is if this thing is totally frosted, that water is going to run down the drain underneath the evaporator here and run into the drain pan underneath the customer's refrigerator. Those pans aren't really designed to hold an entire evaporator of melted ice. They will overflow and get water all over the customer's floor. If they have wood flooring, it can get on the, on the molding, uh, the baseboard molding. It can get in the drywall and cause mold. Um, you have to be careful when you're defrosting large evaporators and a large amount of ice. You have to pull that refrigerator out and make sure you do not cause an overflow problem. Because you fix one problem, now you created another problem. The customer saying you damaged your cabinets, you damaged your floors and everything else. So steamers do work good up to a point. I'm not a super big fan of using steamers. I was always into dry air and not so hot that I'm going to melt and damage my product. So um, let's take a look at this. This is basically the same as the last one. Uh, so we've already talked about that one. What do you think this problem is? Is it overcharged, maybe? Defrost problem. Defrost. Defrost problem. Yeah, it's a defrost problem. So look here that it started frosting up about here, and the evaporator is completely frosted. Why don't we have much frost right where the capillary tube meets, um, but we have all this frost on the bottom? Why do you think there's not as much frost at the top? It didn't get a chance to completely circulate. Maybe. Uh, not that the refrigerant didn't circulate, but once it builds up this much ice, the fan is located above this evaporator right here, and there's a cover that covers over it. This ice starts to restrict the flow of air over the evaporator. So even if it might try to defrost and melt some ice, it's going to rebuild back up real quickly, and there's no airflow, so we're not pulling a lot of heat across this. Also, the capillary tube may, be, may end right here, where the capillary tube may have been installed two inches deep into the evaporator and may be spraying into the evaporator at this point, so this is where evaporation starts to occur. It may not happen here because how deep they put the capillary tube when they installed it. I couldn't tell you 100% unless I opened it up to check it out. Um, what do you think this is? A deep frost problem? No, it's actually a restriction right where the capillary tube comes in. But there's so little refrigerant, it's just happening right in one little spot. There's no frost or moisture appearing whatsoever on the evaporator here. So I just wanted to show you that this here is slightly different than the last evaporator. So you may see something like this. This is a ball of ice, but... This has been happening over a long period of time. For it to make that much ice, that customer had to notice they were having a cooling issue for a long time. So uh, this is something that you need to identify and need to ask the customer, how long have you had problems with the cooling? You know, how long has it been not cooling properly? So this is another restriction problem. Um, let's see. I don't want to go to the next thing yet. So let's go back to what do we do? with a restriction or leaks or component failure. When you first go up to that unit and you feel that 
it's not cooling right and you, you think you have a restriction, what's the first thing you want to do? I'm going to make a list here. Uh, evacuate the freer. Oh. I want to feel the condenser. I don't want uh, uh, evacuating the freon. It is a process, but one thing I tell sealed system technicians is you do not want to go into the sealed system until you have exhausted all the other possibilities. So you want to go and feel the compressor. Is the compressor feel excessively hot? Is the compressor running? How does the condenser feel? Is the condenser dirty? Is the condenser fan working? Then I want to go in the evaporator. Is the evaporator fan working? Is the evaporator have a frost pattern on it? So we want to do all those things. We want to feel the condenser, check, clean condenser coil, condenser fan is warning, compressor, Oop, I spelled compressor wrong, sorry. Compressor is hot. Okay, then we want to go into the freezer. Check evaporator fan. And check evaporator frost pattern. Okay, so when you approach a refrigerator no cool, these are the things you want to check first. You don't want to take any access valves or gauges and everything else and put them on the system until you physically check all of these components. This is step one. I think I'm going to add at the top step one. Okay, you're going to check all these things to see if you can fix them. Now, let's take a look at, this is the evaporator we have, this one right here. Okay, the top right corner. You've checked everything. The condenser's clean. The condenser fan's working. The um, the uh, compressor's running. The evaporator fan's running. And you see just a frost pattern in the upper left-hand corner of the evaporator like we see here. Now, what's the second step that we do? Uh, once you have eliminated all components, we want to, and you're absolutely sure, maybe tap into the system and check readings. Okay, so we're going to add an access valve. Well, for some reason, I don't know what happened here. And where will we add an access valve? process um, on the compressor. So if, if I open up a previous, um, I forgot which one of them uh, had the, uh, the valves in it. Was it this one? Let me see. Uh, I don't see it in this presentation. Um, I don't have it available, but we, we, oh, we, it was the tools, wasn't it? I think it was the, the sealed system tools. Uh, open, and I don't remember where the tools one was. Uh, so I'm not going to be able to open it up right this second. But we had a couple of different types of access valves. What were they? We had a bullet valve. <laughs> and we also had the locking pliers, right? We talked about those locking pliers. Um,
we'll just look at it one more time, at one of these here, that I I like the, my guys to have two of them. I know I gave them all one, but Pedro, if you if you only have one of these, go to Johnstone and pick up a second one. That way you can access both the high side and the low side. So with one of these Val uh, piercing tools, you can pierce the line and hook up a gauge quickly. Where the bullet valves take time, you take them out, you got to find the right fitting, then you have to screw them all down by hand, it takes time. With these here, you can lock them on and hook up your gauges real quickly into the, into the system. So, so I prefer the locking pliers only to reduce the time it takes you to access the system. So we're going to put an access valve on the process stub of the compressor. So um, let me insert a page into here. I will save this and email this all to you as a PDF when it's done. Um, so uh, what, what, what do you think uh, we're looking for when we are testing uh, the process stub of the compressor? What kind of pressures would we be looking for? Any leak? Leak? Leak detection? A, a vacuum? Uh, well, we want to see a pressure of what? What would be a good pressure of a refrigerator with 134A running? What type of pressure would we be looking for? Zero on the low side, right? If it has zero, one evaporator, zero. Zero PSI on the low side. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. I thought I heard a beep. Did somebody try to come in? Um, no, some people are responding on the chat. Okay. Um, I'm not able to see the chat, so sorry. <laughs> um, the process stub pressure of zero PSI on the low side. That is a good running pressure. It could be at one or two inches in a vacuum or one PSI above zero, but that is a good pressure. This is what should be present if it's operating normally, okay? But if it's a restriction, The pressure would be where? In a vacuum. In a vacuum. I think that's how you spell vacuum, right? Wouldn't be your first mistake. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. This is going online, and I'm going to tell them because of you. Okay. So a restriction what? or leak would uh, it would it would be in a vacuum then. Um, so. Let's just say you, you went to that refrigerator that I showed you the evaporator. Um, you put your gauges on it. You, you put an access valve on it. You put the blue hose directly to that valve on the process stub of the compressor, and it pulls down into a vacuum. Okay? So what, what do you do at that point? How do we approach it? If possible, try to get a reading on the high side. I, I, I would say try to get a reading on the high side. The problem is if you have a restriction, and this is a misconception of some people, when a compressor first turns on when it's in a restriction, and let's say somehow pressures did equalize because it wasn't 100% restricted, it takes all the freedom from the low side, pumps in the high side, well, someone's going to say, well, normally it's about 125 PSI on the high side. Um, with a restriction, uh, that PSI is going to go to 180 because its compressor is pumping everything in there. What happens is when a compressor first pumps into the condenser, it's going to change it from low-pressure vapor to high-pressure vapor. So it's going to start condensing process. And in that condensing process, the condenser is going to start to release heat. And you will feel that when you first turn on a unit if it was not running in a, and it goes into a restriction. The same thing might happen if you're low on Freon.
The problem is, is that the condenser is going to uh, produce heat. Okay, thank you, Pedro. So the condenser is going to produce uh, heat. But as the condenser fills up a freon and is restricted, the heat starts to go away. And what happens to your condenser, it almost becomes like a recovery tank when you're recovering freon. So once all the heat's been dissipated, that condenser pressure could drop some because we're not pumping anything more into it. We can't pump any more into it. And the condenser's storing all the refrigerant in the system inside of it so that the pressure's not going to rise. The pressure might actually drop a little bit. So what I like to do to determine, okay, do I have a restriction or I have a leak? We have two options we can do. If it's in a vacuum, try to take a refrigerant tank or Freon and add a little more Freon. Why do you think I would try to add a little more Freon into the system? To monitor what the reading on the low side will react. Okay, and what type, of pressure? what type of reaction do you think we're looking for? If the pressure uh, decreases from vacuum and starts going back towards zero, you would have a leak. If there's no change, then you would have a restriction because the, the freon you just added would run into the same wall um, exactly. that it's already at. Very good, very good. So if you had a restriction and you added a little more Freon and you do this as a vapor in the low side and it pumps it into the condenser, if it's restricted, it's not going to come back to the low side, so it's going to just pull right back down into your vacuum. We do have to be careful of not adding too much Freon because what happens, we'll put an undue stress on that compressor. And, and a couple of things happen when we have restrictions or, or low on Freon is we talked about this the other day is the windings in the compressor rely on the flow of freon to cool the compressor components if we do not have freon flowing through the compressor the actual motor starts to increase in heat and cannot dissipate it because it's inside of a steel ball and it doesn't have the ability to release the heat like an open coil motor so if you don't have enough freon going over it now we superheat the oil and if we get too much superheat on that oil, our, com our compressor is going to start to feel hot. And some of that oil will turn into a vapor and get pumped into the condenser. If it makes it far enough, it gets through the dryer filter in front of that capillary tube. And then all it's going to do is just throw more oil in our capillary tube and create more of a restriction. So if we have a restriction and we catch it early enough, the customer has a restriction on Friday and calls us out on Monday or Tuesday we're showing up, we might be able to save that unit. It might not be that bad. Um, but we have to be able to determine whether we're low on Freon or restriction. So if we add Freon and the low side pressure starts to go back up towards zero, we can see that, hey, maybe there's a leak. Let's repressurize the system based on pressure now, try to get it to about zero PSI on the low side. At this point, if, if the pressures rise, and I'll put it here, rise on the low side back to almost normal, then um, I want to check the high side pressure. I want to know if the high side and the low side pressures are returning to normal. Okay, and if the high side pressure starts to be 125 to 150 on a, on a, on a force draft condenser and 0 to uh, 125 on the high side, 0 on the low side, let me just put 0 PSI low side, 134A, and 125 to 150 PSI high side. Okay, those are the pressures I'm looking for. If I get pressures like that after I add refrigerant, then I want to check for a leak. 
Now, one of the things that uh, Pedro brought to my attention, and I haven't posted it here, I, I'll use it in a future presentation, is that manufacturers are now putting a dye, a leak check dye, inside of their dryer filters. So you could replace the dryer filter and charge that refrigerator back up and tell the customer, okay, I've replaced the dryer filter, I've charged it with the right fillet, uh, Freon, I have zero on the low side and 125 to 150. Uh, Ma'am, I need to see how long is it going to take for this refrigerant to leak out. If I change the dryer filter, one of the first things I want to do after I change the dryer filter is do what kind of test before I charge it. Uh, you want to check if a voltage? there's any leaks in your brazing. Okay, or the leak that was in the system to begin with. So give me a second to type this up as we go so I keep this as notes for you guys. So after changing the filter, what kind of test should I do before charging? I'm going to pressurize how? Pull a vacuum? No. Pressurize with what? Oh, nitrogen? Yes, I'm going to pressurize with nitrogen. Um, and I don't want to test more than the low side test, uh, test pressure plate that we, we talked about yesterday for the EPA. And that would be about 100 PSI with nitrogen. And then I'm just going to use a soap bubble test to check any fittings that were look corroded or any of the brace joints that I did to see if I can find the leak right away. This way I might be able to repair the leak while I'm at the customer's house the first time. If I cannot find any leak, I'm going to vent that nitrogen out. So if, if, if no leak is detected, and, and let me uh, put, uh, if no leak is detected, vent nitrogen I'm going to vent the nitrogen, evacuate, and recharge. And then at that point, I'm going to see if I can evacuate to what? To a vacuum. Yeah, and I'm going to try to get 500 microns. Okay, because if I had a leak in the system before I serviced it, I might have introduced moisture if the leak was on the evaporator on the low side of the system. So I want to pull a vacuum if I couldn't find the leak. Try to achieve 500 microns. Shouldn't take that long with a refrigerator as long as you have a good micron gauge. And you guys know we've had a few issues with our micron gauges, but uh, that's what we have to do. So we evacuate it. We charge it up. We get those pressures to 0134A. And then we tell the customer, ma'am, I tested the unit for leaks. I wasn't able to find any leaks. So let's let this unit run and see how long it cools for uh, and call us back if you're having any more problems. It might take a year before that thing leaks that Freon out where it causes a cooling problem. It might be that small. It may be in the wall of the refrigerator. But if it leaks out in a week or two, it should be something that if the customer called you back, you should be able to find. And at that point, we do something like we said, we put a trace gas of R22 with nitrogen in the system, and we use the electronic leak detector to try to identify a leak. So that would be a leak. What if it's a restriction? What if we charge the unit, and um, let me uh, just copy this, and just paste it down here so I can... Uh, let me ask you this, Z. If, if, if it was low on, free on, then it automatically had to have a leak, right? Yeah, but uh, if we had uh, the unit low on Freon and we added a small charge and the pressure started to rise back up to zero, we would do that. Okay, we would. this is the procedure we would do if, if we thought the unit was low on Freon and I added a charge and both the high and the low side now are, are normal pressures. That's what we would do. But now I'm saying... What if now I added the Freon, but the pressure did not rise on the low side back to normal? What do I want to do? Doesn't that mean it's dirty? 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear you properly. Doesn't that mean it's dirty? That's why we, we're not getting proper readings? No, well, dirty, we're going to physically look at everything. So uh, we said that if it was low on Freon, we're going to add Freon, and if the pressure goes back up, the system had a leak, and we're going to attempt to service or repair the leak. Now, what if we, it, the same problem, we went there and the evaporator looked like a leak or restriction, we added a little bit of Freon, it did not start to cool properly, so we know it's not a leak, and it looked like it's a restriction. The low side pulled back into a vacuum, and the high side uh, was not an accurate high side pressure. Now what do we do? Evacuate the yeah, refrigerator? We, we want to recover the refrigerator. And this would most likely require recovering from both sides of the system. You misspell require. Oops. It's running off the screen. Too. And likely. And from. <laughs> and you, know, you know what it is? My keyboard, the buttons are a little bit hard. Um, and so when I, that one is a typo, but some of them, I might miss a letter. I hit it, but it did, um, it did not appear. Okay. The word right. likely. We understand. Uh, where? Likely. All right, so um, if pressure did not rise on the low side back to almost normal, recover the refrigerant. This would most likely require recovering from both sides of the system. So a high side and a low side access valve. Uh, but let me go back to uh, the low pressure. One more thing that I like to do on a low pressure. Can anybody think? of one other test before adding Freon that might help indicate a restriction versus a low charge or low on Freon, a leak? What else could you do um, uh, to, to check that? Uh, use your hand over the filter dryer um, or along the tubing to feel for a cold spot. Yes, you could do if the filter dryer was cold, that means it's evaporating there and it's low on Freon. But if you unplug the refrigerator and it was low on Freon, but it had Freon in it, what would happen to your refrigerant gauge? It was in a vacuum, let's say 10 inches or 15 inches in a vacuum. What would happen to your refrigerant gauge if you unplugged the refrigerator and the compressor shut off? It would start it would climbing back towards zero. The, well, uh, it. Oh no! It, you said the game. Whoops. Okay, you guys talked over each other, but it it would try to equalize the pressure. The low side pressure would start to rise back up above zero, to whatever, depending on how much charge is left in the system. But if there was not a restriction and it was low on Freon, it would pull into a vacuum. When you shut off. The capillary tube would allow the refrigerant from the high side to flow through, and it would equalize in the system and raise the pressure. So um, that's another quick check to see if that we're low on Freon or not. So um, if the pressure rises back up, then I can add refrigerant and then do this too. So you might want to do turning the compressor off and seeing if the pressure is equalized first um, before you add refrigerant. Um, let me see something here. Uh, if, it, if the vacuum tried to, and then there's add Freon, well, that, that word's not even correct either, huh? Doesn't look like autocorrect is working on this application. Yeah. Or a spell checker.
Okay, if, if, if in a vacuum, try to see if when the disconnecting the power, the refrigerant starts to equalize. If so, add a little more Freon to see if the pressure starts to go back up to normal. So before you add the Freon, and, and I forgot this, sorry, when I was talking, is you want to unplug the refrigerator and then see if your pressure starts to rise right there. And we'll say, hey, if it starts to rise, it's most likely not a restriction. It might be a leak or, or a low charge. Now we're going to add a little Freon to see if we get the pressures up, and we're going to leak check it and so forth and probably pr procedures. Now, if pressure does not rise on low, back on the low side to normal, you're going to recover the refrigerant and most likely require recovery from both sides of the system. So let me add another page. Um, insert page after this one. So let's go to another page. So um, here we, uh, we recovered the refrigerant from both sides of the system. Um, after recovery, let's say step four. Uh, what are we going to do? If it's a restriction? Yes. Uh, after recovery, cut out the uh, filter dryer. Okay, and you said cut out the filter dryer. Why do you say cut out the filter dryer? Because if it's still restricted, it has pressure. And if you uh, heat it up, you're going to get... Um, a hazardous result. Okay, uh, so if you're restricted, but we're restrict we're recovering from both the high and the low side, so the high side is going to be attached right to where the condenser meets the dryer filter on the on the on the copper tubing. So you're going to pull the high side before it even meets the dryer filter. So hopefully we don't have a refrigerant restriction. And that, that is different from another type of restriction where someone did sealed system service before you got there and they soldered a joint together and it filled with, with solder and, and physically restricted the, the tubing so the Freon can't flow through. So here we're talking about a refrigerant restriction or oil or moisture restriction. You want to cut out the dryer filter if you can. And the reason why they recommend cutting it out is because the dryer filter is meant to capture moisture. And if you heat the dryer filter and it's retaining moisture, what's going to happen to the moisture? Release back into the system. It releases back into the system. Now, if you had a restriction, and I said if the compressor runs hot, excessive oil is going to be pumped throughout the system. You may also have trapped oil in the dryer filter or in your capillary tube. So cutting it out will reduce what they call a flashback, which is like you said, if there was pressure built up in there, it could flash like a little flash fire come out real quick when, when the lines come apart. But to cut it out would be an easier way to make sure that we don't take any contaminants that's trapped in the dryer filter and force it back into the system. So after you cut out the dryer filter, what I always recommend is, is to, uh, to remove some of the uh, capillary tube. This uh, will um, most likely be where your restriction's at if you've caught it early enough within the first few inches that come right off the dryer the filter. Uh, and let's see if I can get a, uh, a picture here. I know I have a picture in our presentation of a compressor system. If I I'll go back here, file, open, recent. Uh, I think it's in a dual evaporator flip chart. Um, so if we look here, our dryer filter is right here. So this is the condenser that's coming into the dryer filter. The capillary tube's coming off the top of this. So you want to cut the line right here. And if it's soldered just below it, you can cut it. Once you've cut it out, then you can take a torch and remove the solder joint and cut the capillary tube if you have a long enough capillary where if you cut some off, you don't make it too short for yourself. 
I say recommend to remove two or three inches of capillary tube because if it's restricted, it's most likely restricted at that point. Now, the only way to tell if your capillary tube is restricted after you cut it here, what are we going to do? If I cut it right here, and I'm going to go ahead and just put a, a little uh, line right here. If I go ahead and, and, and cut it right here, and the, and the capillary tube is right here. Are you going to uh, brace it? What, well, what do I want to do to make sure that the capillary tube is n n no longer restricted? I, I cut the capillary tube, and I removed that restricted portion of the capillary tube. What do I want blow, to do? Blow some nitrogen through it. And where would I blow the nitrogen from? This where section would, line? From the other side. Yes, very good, guys. This I would go right here from the process stub, which is also the same as the suction line. Where, where does the low side go in the refrigerator? Where, where does it physically go, the low side? If I go from the compressor and follow the suction line, where would the other end of that suction line be? The evaporator. The evaporator. So if I pump nitrogen in through the suction line, it'll go, or in through the process stub, it'll go through the suction line, it'll go through the evaporator and come out the dryer filter well, not the dryer filter, but the capillary tube where the dryer filter is at. It's not going to come from the condenser. It's going to come from the capillary tube. We may get some of the condenser that run through the compressor head and out through the condenser. But what we're really concerned with now is how good of a flow or pressure is our capillary tube giving us. So when you guys get hands-on practice in the class, I want you to remove the dryer filter put some nitrogen through it and see what a good capillary tube is flowing because if it's restricted you can tell just by how fast the nitrogen is coming out whether it's flowing good or not and whether or not we have a restriction here. So um, through this process stub we'll put about how much PSI? You all um, can see it? 100, 100 PSI. 100 PSI of nitrogen. Now back in the days when we were able to vent refrigerant before all this EPA stuff come, uh, service technicians used something called R11. It wasn't that expensive. They would flush R11 through the system and believe it or not R11 was considered like a cleaner and old school technicians will tell you yeah they would use that and they'd flow that through the system and it would clean all the oil out of the capillary tube. So um, after recovery, we want to cut out the first few inches of capillary tube if we have the ability. Um, then replace dryer filter and recharge. Now, this is going to be the final test. If we felt like we had good pressures out of the capillary tube, replacing the dryer filter would get it up and running. What if the customer called you back a couple of weeks later and said, you know, you change the dryer filter, it's not cooling again. You go there and you go through the process and you said, oh, man, it's restricted again. What do you think? Some type of oil is coming out of that compressor. Very good. Uh, so if it restricted again within a short time, uh, recommend new compressor, evaporator, and heat exchanger. Now let me ask you something. After charging them the first time for the other stuff, and now you're going to, that second thing is going to be way more money. Do you, you get like bad reactions with that? Uh, yes and no. I mean, if you're talking about a, a, a inexpensive top mount or, or a $700 refrigerator, uh, parts and labor is going to cost you close to four or five hundred dollars. The average customer is going to say, "No, I don't want to do it." But what if it happens under the first year factory warranty? If you're working for an extended contract company, might might authorize that type of repair. But what if you're working on a built-in sub-zero refrigerator that's five thousand dollars, or uh, like the ones we have in the class uh, that we have that one refrigerator is close to thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars. An evaporator heat exchanger, even if it was a COD and you charged the customer $1,000, it's 
Sounds like a lot of money, but you know, a thousand fifteen hundred dollar job on a fourteen thousand dollar refrigerator. Remember, the customer changes that refrigerator. A lot of times, a built in refrigerator matches all the appliances in your home. So if they change that one refrigerator and they can't get it to match all the appliances, we're talking about a hundred thousand dollar kitchen for a thousand or two thousand dollar repair. Most likely, those customers say, "Oh, go ahead and do it." So depending on the cost of the product, if it's only a thousand dollar refrigerator or two thousand dollar refrigerator, and it's a five hundred to a thousand dollar repair, uh, a five hundred dollar repair a customer might do if they bought all of the appliances or they came with the home and they're all matching. Let's say the refrigerator is four years old and, and the oven has the same handles, the dishwasher has the same handles, they're all the same polished stainless steel. You might be able to get another stainless steel refrigerator, but the handles might be different. The stainless steel might be a different pattern. It may not match all the refrigerator. Some people may not care. Some people say, I don't care. Fix it. I'm not buying a whole new kitchen. So uh, go, answering your question, it depends on the quality, depends on the customer. You at least have to give them the, the offer. Well, it's a restriction. We can attempt to repair it, but this might be what it is in, in the long run. So you might want to cover yourself and say, hey, listen, you have a restriction. I was able to remove it. And I got the refrigerator working, but I'm going to give you a heads up. This could also happen after I'm done, and uh, this is what it will cost if it, if it needs more parts. I just want to let you know before I leave that if a restriction happened, it could have happened this. And you give them that explanation of it could be oil, it could be a restriction, it could be something like that. Yeah, that sounds good. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. If if that restriction hap happens again and we need to change the compressor, does that mean we have to change the dryer filter again or the first anytime one? The you, first time? Anytime you open up a system for service, you want to change the dryer filter. And we wouldn't just change the compressor because it would be the compressor, the evaporator, and the heat exchanger. The evaporator might be able to get away without replacing it, but uh, remember... The capillary tube is carrying oil, and I've seen evaporators after replacing them, they're filled with oil. And you might also have some oil trapped inside your condenser. I wouldn't say you have to replace it, but I, I would remove the condenser and flush it out with nitrogen to make sure no oil from the old compressor is still inside the condenser before I put that system together. And again, it's going to cost some money to fix that. But make sure if you if it's going to take you the time to do that, you take the time to service it correctly. Because otherwise, right. nothing gets you more fr frustrated than doing an hour and a half job, two hour job. And then a week later, the customer calls you back and says it's not working again. You're upset. I get it. You spent two hours fixing it. And now it's not working again. And you got to do this all over again. I remember an old supervisor, you know, uh, he had a note above his door said, if you don't have the time to do it right the first time, when are you going to have time to do it over? And, and that stuck in my head since the early 90s. And it, it, it's a motto of take your time and make sure you do these jobs right. Um, I'm going to stop with this and answer any questions you guys have. I have some more stuff to go over. But, I, you know, I've already gone like an hour and 40, 15 minutes. And I don't want to make this a two or three hour long lecture. I think tomorrow I'm going to do... Uh, the next part of this, and then Friday, uh, if I have a class on Friday, we're going to do the EPA Type 1. Uh, if not, I'll do it on Monday. Those of you, if you're unable to attend, I will record the lesson and, and post it online for you guys to review it at a later date. Uh, does anybody have any questions about uh, this? And when I get finished with it, like I said, I'm going to save it as a PDF document and email all of this to you. Any questions? No. Yeah, one question, Mr. Z. Uh, I yes. need your phone, num phone number because uh, when I email you, I, I don't know if you get an email from me or not. So I could send you a text message. It'd probably be quicker to get information. That'd be fine, and I'll be glad to show you my phone number. Um, I'll send that to you directly as an email. Um, All right. The the thing is, is it depends. I have three different emails. I have the school email, and I have two different personal emails. And so I've been communicating to you through both the school mail 
and the personal one. And the only re reason why I'm using the personal one is because the school system's limiting me on the size of the files that I can attach an email. So I have okay. to use I have to use my Gmail to send messages, and I created groups so that it's easier for me to add you guys to the email list. Um, any other questions? I'll send out tonight an email with the video, the train. I have to upload it. It will take me a little time, and I'll send you an email to that, and I will send you my telephone number. Anything else you guys need? No, that's it for me. No, that's about it. No. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'll send you an invitation for tomorrow's meeting. Have a good night.